Imagine a little child looking into his mother's eyes. And out of nowhere it says, I love mommy. And the mom so moved and, and wondering what has brought upon this sudden expression of love. Tries to dig deeper and say, to the child, why do you love mom? And the little child says, I love mommy because she cooks for me. I love mommy because she buys me what I need. I love mommy because she gives me allowance. I love mommy because she drives me to go see my friends and the places I want to go. And I'll continue to love mommy because if I do, she'll continue doing these things for me. Now, is that what a mom wants to hear? Of course not. What does a mom want to hear? No, a mom wants to hear only one thing. I love mommy because she's my mommy and I'll always love mommy. That story is a summation of the book of Habakkuk. <laughs> Loving God for God alone, not because of the things that God does for us or gives us. Just as a parent would desire that kind of love because of relationship, not because of the things that the child is, receives from the mom. I've been uh, trying to get through the book of Habakkuk, and if you remember the last time I preached on Habakkuk, there was a period now, just a quick recap. The northern kingdom of Israel has already been enslaved by the kingdom of Assyria. And the southern kingdom of Judah had multiple kings that were evil, and a few that were good, and it was going back and forth. And Habakkuk was living in a time where the leadership in Israel was absolutely corrupt and there was utter injustice in the land. And Habakkuk starts with complaining to God. God, why aren't you doing anything about these horrible leaders in Israel who are just driving Israel into the ground? Why is there injustice everywhere? Why, why don't you send another judge to bring about a repentance and restore your people? in the promised land. Remember the Abrahamic covenant, remember all these things. But to Habakkuk's horror, if you remember, God says, I'm gonna answer you, but you're not gonna like my answer. I'm gonna raise up the kingdom of Babylon. And Babylon's gonna enslave the southern kingdom of Judah, and there will no longer be the people of Israel in the land of Israel. They're gonna be taken captive as slaves. And Habakkuk was livid. He was like, what are you talking about? How could you how, do that, God? What about your promises to us? This was our promised land. How can we lose it? I thought you were our God, our protector, our shield, and our defender. What do you mean you're going to raise a Babylon to take us away? And Habakkuk was so upset because he could not see the perspective of God. That God even uses our sinfulness for His glory. And we learn that through even the sin of Israel, God uses pagan evil kingdoms to establish His kingdom rule and reign over the earth. That as Israel was exiled to all the remote pagan lands, they started singing the gods. And if you look at the book of Acts, it was always the God-fearing Gentiles who learned about God through the exiled Jews in the pagan lands, who were the first to respond. And through these empires, successive empires that, that was prophesied in Daniel, God was bringing his glory to the nations. He was fulfilling the Abrahamic covenant. But how has Habakkuk to know that? There was no way he could. 
There was no way he could understand that the kingdoms, successive kingdoms, were laying the foundation for the missionary journeys of Paul and the early church to spread the gospel in most of the known lands. That was chapter 1 and 2. In chapter 2, we realize that faith enables us to wait patiently in difficult times. Faith gives us perspective when we don't understand what is going on and our world seems like it's falling apart. And our faith is a joyous certainty for an eternity with Jesus. And in chapter 3, Habakkuk goes from questioning God's goodness and arguing with God and being utterly disappointed in God. By ending with praising and trusting God. Let's all rise and let's, as we read about Cup 16 and 19 together. I heard, and my inward parts trembled. At the sound, my, my lips quivered, decay entered my bones. And in my place I trembled, because I must wait patiently for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and though there be no fruit on the vines, Though the yield of the olive should fail, and though the field produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exalt in the Lord, and I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, he has made my feet like hinds feet, and he makes me walk. You may be seated. Um, I, I shared this over at the leaders retreat this weekend, but I, I want to share it again. Uh, this morning, uh, this couple days ago, when I was just trying to get my heart right with God, and um, all of a sudden, as I was reading Psalm 27.4, no, God's word hit me like a, a load of bricks. And it was, it was the sweetest time of communion with God. You know, sometimes we want to get, get right with God and get our, ourselves straight and we want to spend time with God. And, and we go to God and we try to read the Bible and it's like squeezing water out of a dry towel. It's nothing. But sometimes, I don't know why, but we go before God and, and, and we open His Word and we're, we're seeking Him and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit moves. And, and this is one of those rare times where, where as I was reading Psalm 27, 4, I just, I just began to weep and I couldn't sit in my chair any longer. I had to hit the floor and I just had to pray. Psalm 27, 4 says, One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek. One thing I ask of the Lord that I shall seek. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Why? The one thing I ask, that I may be with Jesus and dwell with him in his house. Why? To behold the beauty of the Lord. To behold the beauty of the Lord. There's one thing I want to do. I want to be in God's presence to behold his beauty. Why? Because I want to love God for who He is, not because of my circumstances are so great. And in this passage, this is where Habakkuk ends up at the end of chapter 3. From a heart of complaining about his circumstances to sorrow surrender before God, just wanting to love God. Not because all these great things are happening in his life 
and not because there's some bright future, immediate future around the corner. Because around the corner, there's just captivity and doom. And if you look at what he says, Yet I will exalt in the Lord, and I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. But what God has just said is anything but salvation for Habakkuk. God had just finished saying, you're going to be invaded, you're going to be stripped, taken as slaves from your land, and you're going to be put in captivity. And then he didn't tell him anything else. He didn't tell him the whole plan. And that's all Habakkuk knows. But if you look at the beginning of chapter 3, which we really don't have time to go through, it starts talking about the grandeur and the power of God and who God is. A little bit like we talked about last time when we talked about how God, how great God is. We talked about He's not just the ruler over us or our city, not just over our planet, not our solar system, not only our solar system, but, but galaxies that our minds cannot even imagine how large they are. This is God who we're talking. It's not just some, some other person we, we've met. This is the, the God who spoke the universe into creation. And when Habakkuk realizes that, he has no choice. His heart wants us to complain, but he realizes at the, the last verse of chapter 2, he says, But the Lord is on his holy temple, and let all the earth be silent before him. But think about that. Habakkuk is preaching to himself, because who is complaining the loudest? This whole thing is a dialogue between Habakkuk and God, and Habakkuk is just complaining, and then he realizes. And then there's a shift in the text. He says, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before so he's telling himself, hey, Habakkuk, calm down. God is in control. These horrible things are going to happen, but I don't understand why, but God has a reason for it. And then in, in the beginning of chapter 3, he starts talking about the greatness of God and his power. And, and, and there's some references to the uh, past exodus. There's all these passages that just talk about God's amazing, great power and who God is. And Habakkuk ends the chapter with 16 through 19. And he ends the chapter saying, for the fig should not blossom, there's no fruit on the vines, all the pleasures of life are gone, and there is no food. The flocks are cut off, and there's no cattle in the stall. What does that represent? You know, I spent 10 years in Kyrgyzstan, and you know what? The, the rich people didn't keep their money in the banks. Because in the land, in Kyrgyzstan, you put your money in the bag, and then you go to, they make a withdrawal, and the bank's not there. <laughs> and there's no one to complain to and nowhere to get your money. So you know how they keep their wealth? When they talk to their friends, you know, we might talk about houses and cars, they talk about the number of sheep and cattle they have. Because that represented their wealth. That was their savings account on a rainy day. So here Habakkuk is saying, so everything should be taken away from me, the, the pleasures of life, food, that I have no money in the bank, children are hungry, I have nothing to feed them. No matter what happens, I'm going to worship the Lord. I'm going to exalt the Lord. I'm going to choose to rejoice. Not because my circumstances are so great, because he is the God of my salvation, even though it seems like the opposite at the moment. And then he ends, 19 is the last verse of Habakkuk 3. The Lord is my strength, and he has made my feet like hinds feet. And he makes me walk in high places. And right now, what, what's a hinds feet? Well, a hind is a female deer, and if you know anything about hind's feet, the Bible mentions it several places. It's pretty cool because a hind, a certain deer, they can put their feet 
The, even if they're walking on a cliff and rocky terrain, they'll look at their front feet and they'll step on a, a secure place and then they don't have to worry about their back feet. Because their back feet go exactly to the same spot as their front feet, automatically. I don't know how the biology works, I don't know how that happens, but as a result, they never have to think about their back feet. It just automatically secures them to where their front feet were. And they can just keep hopping and kind of evade predators, do all kinds of things because they have this unique biology where these hind feet are secure and firm. They will not stumble on rocky and difficult terrain. Here, Habakkuk is saying, though all these horrible things happen and the enemy is chasing me and trials await, the Lord will make my feet like hind's feet. And somehow, his plan and his love for me will endure and show itself in the end. Point number one. I only have two points. Let me be sure. But suffering that seems unfair can happen. There will be suffering and pain we don't understand, even if we have lived the life of serving God. Sin has broken the world so much that there is this unfair suffering everywhere we look. You know which group of people are the least able to handle the suffering? It's us. We who live in a land that no one has invaded. There's been no real wars that have really affected us. There's always a supermarket on every corner. We never have to think about, oh, am I going to have the next meal? But for the vast majority of people in the world, that is not the case. Even if we look at our parents, Generation. Look at what they endured. One of the most beautiful things that I've ever seen in my life it was over 30 years ago, but I still remember it vividly. It was almost like a scene of heaven. It was so beautiful. I was on a mission trip to Uzbekistan, and there I found out. Uzbekistan is kind of, if you look above Afghanistan, it's kind of toward the Middle East. There are, some say up to a million Koreans living there, in that area, in all the Central Asian area. Even when I spent 10 years in Kyrgyzstan as a missionary, if you go to the bazaar, there were these Koreans who didn't speak any Korean. And they, their table, most people sell vegetables and stuff. You know what they're selling in Kyrgyzstan? You could buy it. They were selling kimchi. But it wasn't in jars like you buy here. It was just in a pile with flies floating around. And people, the Kyrgyz people would come and buy that, put it in a little plastic bag and take it home, and they loved it. And, and the Koreans never shared the secret of how to make it. It's only the Kyrgyz. That was a, a side industry. Even in Kyrgyzstan, I remember the, the Korean Russians that were there. Well, how did they get there? It was through a trail of tears. If you look at Korean history, in 1907, there was a huge revival. And these women, called Bible women, they would literally carry sacks of rice in their back and a Bible between their arms, and they would travel and walk all across the, the land of Korea after the 1907 revival, sharing the gospel, bringing the gospel to, to every corner of Korea. Three years later, Japan formally annexed Korea, and Korea was no longer a, a nation unto its own. I, I remember my father, I, I, our question, well, Dad, how do you speak fluent Japanese? Well, when he was little, 
He was not allowed to speak Korean in Korea. He had to speak Japanese. Uh, my grandfather was one of the early pastors in Korea, and uh, my mom never spoke of this, my mom's father, but as we got older, my sister is the one who figured all this out and told me about it. He would always have to hide out in mountains because the soldiers would come and break down their door and looking for him because they wanted the Koreans to completely assimilate into the Japanese culture, to not speak Korean, to speak only Japanese, to not worship God, but to bow down to the Shinto shrines. And anybody who did not comply was a threat to the Japanese control of the and so a lot of the early pastors, they, they ran for their lives. They ate roots in the mountains. Their life was not easy. And that's why the, the older generation, my parents' generation, they had such high esteem for pastors because they knew the sacrifice and the suffering that they had to endure to, to cause the gospel to spread in the land of Korea. And during this time, if you look, a lot of people don't understand, well, what do you mean Korean Russians? A lot of people only think that Korea only bordered China, but if you look, there's a piece of uh, Russia on the very northern part of Korea that borders Korea. And if you go back further into Korean history, actually the Korean border was wider and went further into Russia and China. And because of the Japanese occupation, these Koreans, a lot of them settled on the Russian side because it was safer. And they could do more fishing and more farming with the less hassle from uh, Japan. But during Solon's time, 124 trainloads of Koreans were forcibly removed all the way back to Central Asia. If you look where Uzbekistan is, you can see kind of where the Middle East is, and you look up there where it says Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. They were settled throughout that land. And over 50,000 just died of hunger. Because imagine. You, you're used to farming and fishing, but they forcibly remove you and drop you off in the middle of nowhere in an air place where it's impossible to farm, there's no ocean to fish, and they just tell you to survive. Many couldn't, and they died of, literally died of starvation. And think about those lives, and it was those people, those grandmas, over 30 years ago, it was, I saw them, and I worshiped with them, and I, Literally, I, you know, again, it was one of those God moments where I, I couldn't stop crying because it was a scene of heaven. These people that I endured suffering all their lives, that seen their loved ones die of starvation, that had been oppressed, that, that could never return back to their homeland, living in the middle of nowhere, left to just die. Somehow they survived. Somehow they assimilated into the Russian culture, and today their numbers are even greater, up to a million, they say. Now, all those grandmas 30 years ago who could speak Korean, most people don't speak any Korean. And, uh, some are because of the popularity of, of Korean pop culture and whatever else. Many are wanting to return to their Korean roots and wanting to learn now. But imagine living like that your whole life. Your daily food is just tears and hardship and suffering. And instead of being angry at God, God, why? And all these other questions. You're just worshiping God. And although at the moment I, my Korean is very poor, they were singing in broken Korean. But I remember the tune and I, and I remember I could understand part of the words. So when I got home, I, I searched that hymn up in, in, into English. It was an English hymn translated into Korean. And that has become one of my favorite hymns. And that memory of watching those Korean grandmas who suffered all their lives just worshiping God will forever be embedded in my heart. The chorus of that hymn that they were singing, you know what it was? It was something like, 
closely approaching 50. Now you can understand why our social problems are growing exponentially. But when a woman asks her husband, I wonder if any of you wives have asked your husbands this, you know, do you love me? Man, that's probably sends fear into even the strongest men because you don't want to get it wrong. Of course I do, honey. I love you. Sleeping on the couch is no fun. You've got to answer right. But you know, you're, most wives are just, they're not satisfied with that. What's the next question, guys? You know, right? What do they want to know? Why do you love me? Boy, now you're in big trouble. Now you're sweating bullets. And, oh, you're so beautiful, honey. I love you because you're beautiful. Oh, I mean, you take such good care of yourself. And look what, how, how wonderful your figure is. You know, you love outdoor activities. I love going hiking with you, honey. You're fit, you take care of yourself, you eat healthy, you're not a glutton. And we have great chemistry in, or you could fill it in. But you know what that is? That's adult code speak for, I love you because you meet my needs for a trophy. Oh yeah, she's beautiful and she's beautiful. What happens if she gets in a car accident and scars up her beauty or gets old and gets all wrinkled or, or gets fat? Heaven forbid. Will you stop loving her? Oh, I love you because you meet my need for an outdoor companion. It's no fun to hike alone and now I have you. You can come hiking with me all the time. Oh, I, I love you because I have a deep, strong desire for sex, and, and you provide that for me. And oh, I feel better about myself when I stand next to beauty, and you're so beautiful. I, I love you because that's why I married you after all. Now, is that what the wife wants to hear? 
No, that's just like the little five-year-old who says, I love mommy because she feeds me my good No. There's only one correct answer to that question, husbands. You know what it is? I love you because you're my wife. And I have made a commitment to love you until the day I die. And I'll always love you simply because you are my wife. I'm committed to love you. Because everyone knows feelings come and go, right? This is covenant love. This is the love that God desires from us. And when everything goes well in the world, it's hard to discern why, we're, why we say we love God. It's only in the dark, difficult times that our love for God is tested and purified. You know what, though? There's so many parallels in the book of Job to Habakkuk. I had to keep going back and forth, back and forth. And understanding of Job helped me to understand Habakkuk. Do you know what the main theme of Job is? I always thought it was suffering and enduring. But it's not. It's actually what we're talking about today. It really is. Uh, and I challenge you to go study the book of Job. Um, if you look at how the book of Job starts out, now God is so pleased with Job, and God starts saying, you know, there's no one like Job in all the earth. Job is blameless, he's upright, he fears God, and he turns away from evil. He's amazing, he, he defends the widows and orphans. He crushes the mouth of the wicked and trying to devour the innocent and helpless. He's such an amazing, righteous man. And you know what Satan says in verse chapter 1, verse 9? This is, I believe, after saying Job, what I think is, is all, what the whole book of Job is about. You know what Satan says? Satan says to Job, Job doesn't love you. He only loves himself and he's using you. He's not really serving you, he's serving himself. Because you give him so many good things. Who wouldn't serve you and fear you if you made him wealthy and prosperous, gave him good health, gave him an amazing family? And so Satan accuses Job and says, does not, Job, Job does not love you for nothing. He only loves you because he's selfish. Because you've given him so many good things. Take all that away and see what happens. And you know how the book of Job ends? Sure, there's much complaining, but very similar to Habakkuk, God shows Job how great and awesome he is and who he's really talking and complaining to. And in the end, Job is able to say, even when his own wife says, curse God and die, he's able not to turn his back on God. And he's able to say things like, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. And at the end of the book of Job, you know what happens? Job tells us that Satan is a liar. It actually proves he's a liar. Because it proves that we, servants of God, can love God for God himself and God alone. That it is possible. Doesn't mean everyone does it. Well, what does that mean? It's like, um, like, how many of you guys ever, I don't know if you've ever dated or ever, or whatever, you say to someone, hey, let's jump in the car and drive an hour and a half and go see the sunset at the beach. You're spending your time, your money, and then you get there early and it's freezing and but let's wait a little bit, sunset's coming. Why do 
they do that? Now, do you get paid for waiting there to see the sunset? Is there something you gain? No. You want to go see the sunset simply because it's beautiful. And, and you can just appreciate the beauty. And that is the motivation that God wants us for worshiping Him, for loving Him. And this is where Job ends up. Let's read these again. Well, the fig tree should not blossom, no fruit on the vines, olives should fail, fields produce no food, flocks should be cut off. No cattle in the stalls, or you take everything away from me. Yet I will exalt in the Lord, and I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. I will love God for God alone, not for what he gives me. Not because so many good things are currently happening in my life. Can you love, worship, and trust God when you're laid off? When your bank account is empty and all you have is debt? Can you love, worship, and trust God when you've lost a loved one? Utterly disappointing you and, and not answering all your prayers that you prayed for their health? Can you love and worship and trust God when your children are hungry and there is no food? When there is war and danger which seems impending? The book of Habakkuk teaches us that Satan is a liar and that in our darkest times, Satan will whisper all kinds of things to us. But the book of Habakkuk teaches us those are lies, and yes, we can love God for God alone, and we must love God for God alone. Central truth. Habakkuk shows us that it is possible for us to love and trust Him, even in our darkest times. We must love God for God alone. We must love God for who He is, not what He has done. Go to God in prayer.